let's start and welcome everyone to our discussion today about the wonderful topic of uh, inflation, which is giving us more dollars in our pocket and, and less value to all the dollars we have in our pockets and that we had before and then which have disappeared as well. And so today we'll have uh, two panelists discussing inflation. First, Dan Flynn, <clears throat> a longtime American Spectator senior editor. He writes our morning AM, Spectator AM uh, newsletter, which is filled with must read information about <clears throat> the very latest things that happened overnight. I don't know how he maintains his work schedule because uh, he writes 24 seven. And, <clears throat> and Dan has been following inflation and the whole monetary aspect of it, especially the decline of our currency, the devaluing of our currency very uh, openly by the people who run our country, especially Federal Reserve and the White House and the Congress. And uh, it's a huge scandal, it's been waiting to happen and it's happening because the current president decided to just throw more worthless dollars at voters and uh, using any excuse in the books, such as the pandemic, to just try to keep the Democrats in power eternally. But I don't know how they stay in power if the currency they use, we have to use, is worthless. But Dan will explain all of that <clears throat> when he leads off today. But then we'll also have Dave Catron, who uh, <clears throat> last time spoke about uh, the 25th Amendment. And this time we'll speak about the, especially the politics of inflation. Uh, he's been writing columns on it. They've been picked up widely. And, uh, and there's something about inflation that doesn't let, let the political spinners get away with their usual lying. And so heading into this <clears throat> November's elections, um, inflation is going to be the number one issue, no doubt, unless the friendly media finds other topics to kind of bury the, uh, the real issue that matters to people, to voters. And, and they're not gonna be fooled on that front. So uh, Dave, uh, I should note as well that Dave is a long time contributing editor. Uh, he's a graduate of a couple of <coughs> fine Southern schools University of Georgia, but he has his MBA and uh, his BA in liberal studies. Hmm, is that still <laughs> allowed? From Oglethorpe University. And he lives in Southwest Georgia. I mean, the real Georgia, not just Atlanta. And you can follow him on Twitter at, at, at Catronicus. I mean, that's from the Latin. Okay. So, um, <clears throat> but please, uh, Dan, uh, lead off and set the stage for what is uh, taking place right now. Sure. Um, I think on inflation, I, I'd rather mm -hmm. just in these br the brief time I have here to, to talk about it as not a right-left issue, but kind of a smart, stupid issue. I think a lot of people don't know what inflation is. And universally, we confuse the symptoms of inflation for inflation itself. And what I mean by that is that when the CPI comes out every month, and I think the CPI came out last uh, week and it was 8.3% uh, for April and it had been 8.5% for, for March, um, people think that you know roast beef costing uh, 13.99 a pound instead of 9.99 a pound like it was a few years ago, that that's inflation. That's the, the symptom of inflation. And I think politicians have a vested interest to keep people ignorant on that. Um, you heard the Biden administration saying that, um, you know, it was the greedy meat conglomerates that were at fault. Uh, Elizabeth Warren blamed Kroger's and others, you know, Kroger's, which I think is the only part of the country Kroger's isn't, is, is not, doesn't have a place is, is New England. Um, but she blamed Kroger's for the, the rising price hikes. Um, Robert Reich in his column, he blamed uh, McDonald's and Starbucks and, and Target. And there are all these greedy people jacking up the price. Well, what's, what's really happened is we have greedy government officials who are incontinent, who um, are afraid to raise taxes, they're afraid to cut spending. And at this point, 
they're unable to, to raise abroad money to finance the debt. Um, so raise money from China or Germany or some of the usual suspects uh, to buy treasuries and, and finance our debt. And so to, to, to fund the type of deficits that we've been having, you know, in that $3 trillion range, um, you know, the, the way that you do that is essentially by counter, counterfeiting your own currency. And that's what the Federal Reserve basically did starting in September of 2019. You know, and, and Trump was part of this where he was talking about, um, you know, it, it wouldn't be so great to have zero um, interest rates and Europe does it like this. And he's putting a lot of pressure on the Federal Reserve at that point. Federal Reserve started getting involved in um, the repo market and there became a quantitative easing without anyone calling it that. And it was something like the likes of which we haven't seen in history. The Federal Reserve, the balance sheet was at about 3.7, 3.8 trillion in September, 2019. It's now over 8.9 trillion. And um, so if you increase the amount of money that the Federal Reserve holds, the amount of assets that they hold rather, um, by more than double in just a couple of years, bad things are gonna happen. And N1 increased by a lot more than that. Um, and so when you have this dishonesty with politicians saying, well, let's blame the businessmen or let's blame Putin for invading Ukraine for this, that those are dishonest words covering up dishonest numbers. And that's what inflation is. You have, you know, it'd be almost as if if you had a short guy as the, as the king and he said, you know what? A foot is now going to be 10 inches so that he could be six feet tall. We would all kind of laugh at that because a foot is a measurement. It's a, it's a standard measurement. And I think with dollars, um, for some reason, we accept it when people manipulate that measurement. We wouldn't accept it if the butcher said, well, you know, a pound is now going to be um, 10 ounces. So here, buy a pound of hamburger. And we would say, no, this is a scam. But when we do that with regard to currency, um, People somehow accept it that that's that's the norm. Even the Federal Reserve saying we have a, a, a you know a two percent inflationary goal. Why don't we have any inflationary goal? Why, why isn't it zero? Um, and I'll, I, let me just read you something. I think it's important. It's the only thing I'm going to read you this whole hour, and then I'll I'll turn it over to, to uh, Dave. Um, this is my copy of Human Action. This is Ludwig von Mises. Um, he wrote this about 80 years ago. And there's just a couple of sentences that he wrote that I think is extremely important to understanding inflation. He said, the semantic revolution, which is one of the characteristic features of our day, has also changed the traditional connotation of the terms inflation and deflation. What many people today call inflation or deflation is no longer the great increase or decrease in the supply of money, but its inexorable consequences, the general tendency towards a rise or a fall in commodity prices and wage rates. This innovation is by no means harmless. It plays an important role in fomenting the popular tendencies towards inflation. And politicians naturally want to foment those popular tendencies. They want to exploit that because they don't want to be blamed for inflation. But there's also a more profound reason they do this. They distort and distract because they don't want people to realize what it is that's causing inflation. And that and what's causing inflation is reckless fiscal policy driving reckless monetary policy. That's what we've seen the last couple of years. And because the people that hold the keys to the kingdom on the fiscal side, they want to keep being reckless. Um, they don't want to let everyone know that, gee, we did this. The central, the, the central bank did this. The Federal Reserve did this. And they did it because we left them holding the bag because we, you know, we went into a uh, uh, deficit by $3 trillion these last couple of years. And so that's what's causing inflation. And that's what's going to get us out of inflation by having more responsible monetary policies. Thank you. Well, yeah. And Dave, please join. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I um, agree with that last statement particularly because, I mean, this is not, you know, in spite of the nonsense that appears in, in the media, and, and I, I can never tell whether these people are really are, are dishonest or dumb or both, but, you know, they, they, um, they act like inflation is something that has happened like a hurricane or something uh, under uh, uh, Biden's administration, you know, it looked like it's magic. I mean, but it's but it's not. I mean, he, even uh, the Obama's advisors, uh, people like um, uh, Furman, I think, is one of them. Uh, Larry um, Summers is another one, and Steve Ratner. These guys were all three 
uh, high level Obama economic advisors, all of them said, please do not do this. It, meaning uh, passing the American Rescue Act, which dumped $1.9 trillion into the economy and just poured it into the economy with no change in productivity or whatever. So it's, it's largely um, uh, something that is created by the Biden administration, no matter how many whoppers they tell about it. It's not like a natural phenomenon or it's not the pandemic and it's not uh, Putin or whatever it is. And uh, the, the unique thing about um, inflation, which is, which is good for, for the good guys, AKA us, um, rather than the people that are doing this irresponsible spending, is that there's no way to hide it. I mean, the media can't, you can't spin the public. You know, when they're going, when they were paying 250 for gas last year or two years before, uh, two years ago, and they're now paying $5, there's no way, there's no amount of baloney you can put out there in the media that's going to change the price of the pump. And um, so where you get, you get into the tricky stuff where they claim, um, as uh, uh, Dan said, that there's price gouging or something like that. You know, you, you can't price gouge oil with the price of oil. I mean, this is a commodity that's controlled by about a zillion different people doing a zillion different things at one time. I mean, they, they literally have um, uh, cargo ships full of oil that, that change ownership three times from sailing from the Middle East until they get to the United States. I mean, that's how much trading there is in the oil commodity market. And so, uh, we've got a situation here that you can't hide from the voter. It's, it's a very real situation, and it is definitely uh, something that is created by the Biden administration. Uh, the, the, the Trump administration con contributed to it, obviously, as well, because they, they did the CARES Act, which I, I, I forget how much money it was, about a trillion into the economy. And so um, that was going to cause inflation anyway. Biden was going to inherit inflation, even if he did nothing. But this, the, the, the $1.9 trillion stimulus package that he insisted on putting through with no Republican support whatsoever, that's, that's the, what uh, Stephen Ratner called the original sin. And that's, that's where we are. And um, so it's, it's, what it reminds me of, when Dan was talking, it reminded me of, this is degrading the, the, the value of money is something that, uh, uh, dishonest rulers have been doing for a long time. Nero, for example, you know, he, he inherited, we're going back to Rome now, this, this is how long this stuff has been happening. He inherited a gigantic uh, uh, amount of money. And in other words, he, he could have, if he'd have been sane about the way he spent money, he would have been probably um, not, ha I mean, he was essentially broke by the time he, he committed suicide. But uh, what he did was he, he deliberately devalued the money. They, they, I mean, literally would put less gold in the coins. And, that, and those, of course, were used to pay the soldiers. The soldiers got tired of what, what was really inflation, what we call inflation. And, um, and so this has been going on for 2,000 years or longer. And uh, they're doing it basically so they can have more government money to spend in order to buy votes with various and sundry programs. And um, anyone who tries to behave as if this is a natural phenomenon or a, uh, a thing that's happened to Biden or the Biden administration or the Democrats uh, should be ignored because they're full of baloney. Um, let me see what else. I, uh, I think, oh, I, I know what it is. This is the, one of the other things I wanted to say before I was, this introductory bit was, I love it when when um, the, the media right now is still trying to tell us that the economy is better than it is. It's like it's like the, the quote that is often attributed to Mark Twain, where Wagner's music isn't as bad as it sounds. Well, that's basically what they're telling the public about the economy. The economy is way better than it looks when you go out to the store, when you go to the gas station. I don't think it's going to work. I think it's one of the reasons unless, the, unless the, the Democrats are extremely creative um, about the, the midterms, they're almost certainly going to get killed in the midterm as a result of this because everybody lives this every day and nobody likes it. So that's my opinion for the first. <coughs>
I, I've got a question uh, about politicians and inflation. I mean, we've seen Biden, in, he inherited an inflationary situ uh, situation and he insisted on doubling it, tripling it, or <laughs> heedless, clueless. And he's still wanting to do it. Yeah. Um, and it, my mind went back to Gerald Ford. Somehow this is never mentioned these days, but he had a very famous approach to fighting the inflation that would eventually do in Jimmy Carter, his successor. And here was Gerald Ford, our first non-elected president, so as I can tell. Uh, and he came up with something called WIN. And everybody wore these buttons that said WIN. <laughs> and that was an acronym for uh, WIP Inflation Now. Sort of uh, uh, cruel and uh, an unusual punishment for uh, for inflation, but and 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 it had no real substance, but it was sort of a feel good approach, and they thought that's the way to deal with inflation, like increase car pooling, because I, I guess this went hand in hand with the uh, with the gasoline shortages and and the, and the rising gas prices, and it didn't last very long. But everybody sort of scoffed at it. Right. Well, it deserved yeah. to be scoffed at. Yeah. And why, you know, why is no one scoffing at at Joe Biden's economic policies? Or well, that's the, the, the I'm sorry. The, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. The, the, the interesting thing about that, of course, is in those days, uh, obviously Ford was a Republican, so the media in general are going to criticize him more, no matter what he does. Yeah. You know, in the, in those days, but you know, when when Carter became president, the media even criticized Carter for some of his policies. In those days, you, you would actually have real journalists who would point out how dumb some of this stuff was. One of the things that was interesting about um, when I was looking back at what Carter's behavior uh, was that on April 11th. You know, almost exactly 44 years uh, ago, uh, Carter said he was going to make inflation his top priority. Inflation at that point was uh, at 6.6% or something. By the time he got finished making it his top priority, he got it about 13.5, uh, meaning the CPI. And so, um, yeah, and the, and, I mean, Biden has just got a very friendly press. I mean, there's just no good escaping that, you know, and if it's not for people like us, you know, nobody, nobody would be telling the truth about it. And, uh, but, you know, the, the, the symptoms of it uh, is what everybody feels, as Dan says, is, is the actual prices they're paying. And th there's no spinning that, you know. You, you, can't, you, can't, you can't go up to the, the gas station and, and um, I mean, it, you don't have to see that, I did this sticker on the, on the pump to realize that Biden is complicit in this. I think everyone, even when you don't see that sticker, um, you see it. And even if they were to manipulate the data on the CPI, uh, which I'm not accusing them of doing this, but even if someone were to do something like that, it wouldn't matter because everyone experiences inflation. There's, there's an inflation report people in Washington get every month. And we got it last week and it said 8.3%. Great. There's an inflation report that moms and dads and all people around the country get every time they go to the pump, every time they stand in the supermarket checkout line. I almost have a heart attack when I go into the uh, the beer store and a case of Budweiser is twenty four dollars. It was like nineteen bucks, eighteen bucks a few years ago when I was a kid. It was half that. It was like twelve bucks. Um, and that kind of shows you what inflation is. It's a devaluing of the currency. You, you're paying a lot more for the same amount. And so there's an inflation report that we all experience. Hey, if you want to buy a new washer and dryer, you're gonna, there's going to be an inflation report right there that you're going to get right then. So it really doesn't matter about that printed report that we all get from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. What, what matters is sort of, the, you know, we're all consumers, is that report that we all experience every day. So you can't hide from it, as, as David was saying. Yeah, they, um, uh, what I, I find interesting is, is, the, is some of the attempts to pretend like it's a sort of natural phenomenon that, that is sort of beyond anybody's control in Washington. Of course, what they're eventually going to have to do, what, whether the Biden administration is going to do it, is, is, 
doubtful. It, but they're they're going to have to do the same thing that Reagan did. I mean, you know, with, with, when Reagan took office, they got Paul Volcker in there, and he's just he slammed on the brakes, and everybody knew the recession was going was going to follow shortly thereafter, which it did, uh, by raising interest rates. I guess buying up of the government bonds and the usual stuff the Fed does to to, to shrink the money supply, and uh, and somebody is going to have to do that. And I, 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 got to, I don't really have any confidence that the Biden administration does have the courage to do that. Well, you know, it's interesting. And, and the, uh, the, the, the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve, it's basically at the same place. It really hasn't moved. It hasn't gone up, but it's essentially at the, sa- at, at the peak. It's still $8.9 trillion. It's a little bit less than what it was at the peak, but uh, we're talking about a rounding error. It was $8.9 trillion then. It's $8.9 trillion now. So when the Federal Reserve says... Well, we're going to sell off some of this, um, this, uh, these assets, and we'll get things back into into whack. Well, they haven't done it yet. They keep talking right. about doing it, and they haven't done it. So, I'm, um, I, I think they're going to start doing. It. I mean, they, they they've raised rates. I, I, you know, that's a smart move in this type of uh, situation. But I, I think they need to get us out of that um, mindset where you have the federal reserve owning $9 trillion in assets. That's, you know, where did we get to that point? That's insane. Yeah. Uh, you know, and during the, the official statement that Biden issued the day that the Bureau of Labor Statistics report came out uh, in the second paragraph, he said, most people realize this is a problem the fed has to control as if the fed's got nothing to do with this administration. Right. You know, but but I'm going to make it my top priority, and we're going to really work on this, and we're going to we're going to we're going to get rid of price gouging and all the rest of that. But um, you know, it, the the reality is that this it, it's like um, uh, uh, those kinds of medications they used to take in the 19th century, right? Now, now you can go get cured of something with with with, a, with something that doesn't hurt, right? When in the 19th century, if you took a, an effective medication, it was going to hurt. And uh, was, as far as the economy goes, the cure for this is going to hurt. Gonna, whoever, had, whoever ends up doing it is going to, the politicians uh, that have the guts to do it, sooner or later, somebody's going to have to do it. But unless the economy just, just you know, implodes, uh, it, it's going to uh, dump us into a recession. Sure. I mean, in a bad way, because, um, you know, they, they've been spending like, like drunken sailors. In fact, it's kind of an insult to drunken sailors with him and spending. Well, can I bring in uh, the role of Ronald Reagan in defeating inflation? Uh, we remember in his first year, Volcker was squeezing inflation out of the economy. And uh, Reagan, I don't remember whether he spoke out or didn't, but he, he was kind of mum. But his numbers were terrible. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and... I uh, remember the Wall Street Journal pounding Volcker. I mean, one of our writers named Volcker a man of the year, you know, facetiously. Uh, but he was seen as almost enemy number one because he was making it very hard for anyone to be able to invest. Yep. Borrow to invest. And, uh, but we wrote it out. And then the rest of it is history. Uh, uninterrupted growth for, I don't know, how long? Yeah. But uh, I, nowadays... I mean, it's, it's impossible to find a politician who would, who would uh, go along. Well, yeah, right. See, Reagan was, was an unusual politician. I think we have some politicians now that, that would, for example, I, I, I'd be willing to bet, for example, Ron DeSantis, if he ran in 2024, he'd be willing to do what Reagan did. Because Reagan, I mean, he basically, I'm sure they had a conversation, um, uh, you know, in in the White House, probably five conversations. Mm-hmm. Okay, there's only one way to fix this. We're going to have to shrink the money supply, and it's, it's not going to be painless. So get ready to get trash in, uh, in in the media. Get ready to be a bum. And you remember they they used to go around uh, when when they slammed the brakes on the money supply. Uh, well, uh, they they uh, farmers were hit fairly badly, and um, and so that you had you had uh, journalists running around trying to get a farmer to cry into the camera. I don't know if you remember that or not, but you know, Reagan, Reagan was like destroying the American farm and he was destroying this and he was destroying that. Uh, but of course it, it was really uh, doing something that, you know, it was, it was like firing the, 
the air traffic controller. You know, it, it was something that he was willing to do. Not that many politicians these days are willing to do the hard thing. Yeah. And so if they don't do the hard thing, what happens? I think you probably have more more of the same. You know, un unfortunately, um, you know, one of, some people are obviously fooled. They think, well, that there was this COVID thing that happened, and now that the Russians are invading Ukraine, and um, there, there, you know, there's a sort of a, a disconnect between cause and effect because obviously you can't have the effect predate the cause, and inflation predated some of these things, at least it, it certainly predated the uh, invasion of, of Ukraine. The, um, the easy way to rebut this when they, they talk about supermarket chains and the greedy meat conglomerates and the greedy oil executives, um, inflate, you know, money has to do with basically 50% of all transactions. And so when you look at the Bureau of Labor Statistics uh, CPI index, and there are, I think, 21 different indicators, heads and subheads, when all 21 of them are, uh, you know, there's not a single one of them that are beneath the Fed's um, inflation target of 2%. They are all inflationary and they are all above what the Fed's target is. At that point, you realize, well, this isn't some guy at Kroger's raising the prices. Something else is going on. So what's the common denominator of everything? Well, the common denominator of everything is money, that there is a money involved in, in just about every transaction. So there can be um, instances where you do have supply chain issues in, in, um, you know, with, with gas and oil, for instance, and that can cause um, supply and demand on the product side can cause the, the price to go up. That happens, obviously. Um, but when everything goes up, it's not about supply and demand issues on the product side. It's about supply and demand issues on the money side. If this were or five things or 10 things in the CPI's index, we could say, well, you know, there, there's some sort of micro things going on with this industry. But when it's everything, you cannot keep up that lie. Beyond that, you, you ignore what's going on in the United States. Um, look at what's going on in the world. If you look at, Joe Biden would have us believe that everywhere, you know, the inflation's the same everywhere. We're all in the same boat. We're all suffering from these same supply chain issues. Look at inflation in places like Switzerland and Vietnam and Saudi Arabia and Cameroon. They are all basically at the Fed's uh, 2% um, uh, target rate. Japan is at about 2%. So there's a lot of countries in the world that are not enduring these sort of price hikes that we're enduring. Um, what is it? What are we doing differently than them? And I would argue that we're, we are doing differently than them is we um, created a mess load of money that didn't exist. We'd essentially counterfeited our currency and we devalued our currency. We trashed our currency and they didn't. Now, it happens to be the case that there are some countries around the world that have trashed their currency even worse. You know, Argentina's rate of inflation right now is 58%. In Turkey, it's 70%. In Iran, it's 36%. So how do you get these variations, these wide variations in um, the CPI, the Consumer Price Index of, of the various countries? You can go from something like Japan, which is 2%, to something like um, Turkey, which is 70%. Why are they different? Well, part of the reason they're different is because Japan isn't trashing their currency right now, and Turkey is. They're creating huge amounts of money. That's what we did. If, if you look at the Federal Reserve's balance sheet starting in September of, of, um, of, of 2019, you'll see not a trend line that goes like this. You will see a trend line that goes almost like a right angle. When you look at M1, which is basically the measurement of uh, cash and assets that can be easily converted to, to you know, liquid currency that can be easily converted and liquidated. Um, you look at that and it, again, it is not a trend line that we're used to seeing going up or down. It's something that just goes straight up like the Empire State Building. And so um, there's a consequence to that. When M1 trip uh, quart, quant, quintuples, when it's five times the amount of what it was in, 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 in 2019, um, there's going to be consequences to that. You can't have a, some, you know, a supply of something increased by five times, whether it's widgets, whatever they are, or, or automobiles, or bananas, anything, gold. You can't have that type of increase and not um, have the, uh, the, 
uh, an impact on the value on the on, on the on the price on the consumer side. And that's what's happened with money. Um, you've had this dramatic explosion in the amount of money that we have available. And it doesn't correspond to, to a dramatic explosion in productivity or in the economy dramatically exploding. It just came out of nowhere. And we're paying for that right now. That's simply the alpha and omega of what's going on. And any sort of discussion about what, uh, you know, the, the CEO of Kroger's is doing or what, um, you know, the greedy meat conglomerates are doing or some guy in a breast milk factory is doing, that's just a distraction at this point, deliberately so. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Another thing the, they've done, too, is on the supply side or on the productivity side, they've decur and, and particularly with regard to fossil fuels, they've discouraged production. You know, uh, the, they're saying, oh, well, you know, the big oil companies have got 9,000 leases. They're not doing anything with, uh, you know, and, and, and the rest of the story that they're, they're claiming that you know, is causing high gasoline prices. They're paying they're assuming that nobody understands how the oil market works, which it, it doesn't, it, these, these things are being, these prices are being raised at the retail level in anticipation of high wholesale prices, because even though oil has dropped a little bit, you know, there's, there's no investment in, in, in future exploration or productivity because the Biden administration keeps sending them a signal once a week at least that we're going to destroy your business. And so why would anybody invest in productivity, whether they got a lease to, to, to drill or not? And um, that's that's the other thing. You know, we had last quarter was the first time productivity had dropped, I think, since the, the beginning of the pandemic. And when we decided to close down the economy, like, don't get me started on that thing. But um, <laughs> I mean, this is dumb with a capital D. I mean, this makes dumb look dumb. But um, at any rate, uh, so there, there's been not only are they they, they are devaluing devaluing the currency by by flooding the economy with money, you know, uh, way beyond anything connected with productivity or anything else. But they're but they're actually discouraging productivity. So so that you know that's it's it's not the fault of of, of big meat or big oil or big you know big baby food. You know, whatever it is, you know, I can't, I cannot believe anybody. I, I know they do this on MSNBC and CNN, and I read it in the New York Times. I read it in the Washington Post. And I'm, I, 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 I'll, I'll be sitting there next to my wife. and I'm, I cannot believe a grown man has, I mean, I would quit before I would write something like that. I mean, if Vladdy, Vladdy said to me, Dave, I want you to write an article that says, you know, black is white and blue is green. And, and, and red is orange or whatever it is, I'd say, I'm not going to do that because it's not true. But I mean, routinely, I read like three or four articles this morning on this basic subject from major publications that, that were essentially fiction, you know? And so that, that gets back to the whole political element of it. Uh, you know, the, I, don't, I, I don't know, I, I, I assume the Democrats, maybe the Democrats just, who, whoever is making the decision in the White House particularly, uh, I, I assume that he's, he's maybe thinking, well, Joe's not up for re-election until 2024. We'll worry about that next year. You know, right, right now we'll see if we can hang on to Congress. But uh, it, it's, a, it's a thing that's, uh, it's, yeah, they're having a, a huge uh, drop in support among uh, Latino voters, for example. I mean, this, this is it. You know, ch changing them to, to Latinx, you know, as opposed to Latino or Hispanic or whatever it is. They don't care about that. They do care about uh, how much they're paying for gas and how much they pay for groceries. Because, they, you know, a, a lot of these folks, they're not like us where we can work, get a laptop. You know, most of these folks actually have to go somewhere and do something and produce something. And, uh, and, and they're like, I think the last poll I saw, 52% of Hispanics on the, on the generic ballot are going to vote public. If they do that, Democrats might as well not show up. They can't. The Democrats cannot win with numbers like that. So um, uh, I, uh, well, I'll stop talking. <laughs> if I can add to something uh, Dan said about uh, inflation rates in other countries, you didn't mention Europe. And I don't know the precise numbers, but I read a lot about uh, uh, the British press, in the British press, and uh, England, the UK, is. Uh, going through something quite similar. 
to us. Switzerland would be an example where their inflation rate right now is two and a half percent. So yeah. they usually are pretty sensible people, the, the Swiss, and um, have a good reputation when it comes to money. They did not do what we did with regard to our money. A lot of countries in Europe did do what we did, um, which is to say that they shut down, they had lockdowns, their economy stopped, and they said, how can we keep funding this juggernaut? How can we keep paying teachers who don't teach? How can we keep paying people who work for the federal government who aren't working, stay at home? Oh, we can create money out of, out of thin air. And that's what they did because they did, you know, in that moment in time, they certainly couldn't tax it because there were so many people out of work, thrown out of work because of what the government did. And also to some extent because of the pandemic. And so they created this money. And so there, there are other countries, particularly in Europe, um, that, that um, you know, are, are, their inflation rates are, 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 are pretty high. Their CPI rates are pretty high or whatever they call their uh, CPI rates in their country. Um, and then, the, but there are countries like Switzerland that are very low. And you have to ask yourself, well, why do you have all these countries, Ecuador, why is their, their, their um, rate of inflation very low? And Argentina, which is, you know, not too far from there, why is it extremely high? And, I, and the reason is, is you know, we're all subject to the same global forces. We're all subject to the same global headwinds and we all were subject to COVID um, and we're all subject to the um, impact on gasoline prices that the Russian invasion of Ukraine is gonna have. What is the difference between Ecuador and Argentina? And I would argue the difference is, is that one country trashes their currency by creating an enormous amount um, uh, you know, of the Argentine peso, for instance, and another country, Ecuador, um, basically you know, creates the amount of money that the, their, their uh, economy demands and they, they're, they're responsible. And I think that's the, that's the difference. But would you say that Europe has been trashing the euro? Um, I don't know Not the as badly. answer to that. I, 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 there was actually a, a thing that came out by the um, uh, Fed um, where a couple of guys looked at the OECD countries in Europe and, and we're three or four percent higher than them. They're, they're, they're a little, their inflation is higher than it's, it normally is, but we're still three or four points ahead of most developed countries, including I know the I know prior to all this stuff breaking out in Russia, Russia was a country whose inflation rate, rate was very low. Um, you had China was a country whose inflation rate was very low. And now it's going to be artificially low because their economy is, is in, a, in a really weird spot. And obviously Russia is going to be low and it's, it's, their rate's going to be meaningless because of, of what's going on in those countries. But prior to all this stuff breaking out, uh, Russia's rate of inflation was far lower than our, our, our rate of inflation. Um, and it was in that Fed 2% range. I don't know the exact number, but my point is that there is great diversity in um, what we would call the rate of inflation country to country. And that would seem to undermine Bri Biden's point that there are these external global forces that are, are driving this thing. It's not external global forces that are driving this thing. It's central banks um, in each country, or in the case of, of um, the European Union, um, you know, it's it's their own central bank with the, with the euro. Yeah, they they have done something similar to what we've done, but they they sort of did the equivalent of stopping with the CARES Act and not doing the American Rescue Act, and so they they their inflation has increased in the last two a couple of years. Most of those developed countries over there, but they're they're, they're no there's not been this skyrocketing thing that we've seen here. And this, this, this goes back to this uh, American Rescue Act, dumping this 1.9 trillion. And of course, they, they're still dying to throw some more money at it. Uh, no, so so you, you have to wonder, um, or I wonder anyway, and, and you, Dan, you give me your opinion on this. Do you think it, that these, you know, the, the Democratic Party in general has lurched to the left. Do you think that is now basically under control of people who just don't believe in the market? In other words, when you talk about the money supply, uh, you know, do they think this, this is like an artifact of capitalism? And if they, if they do some sort of uh, quasi-socialist um, uh, economy that, that, that the market forces are somehow going to disappear? I mean, because... I mean, I mean, my view of that is that 
the market is there. The market's the market. Okay, it's been, the only thing you can do by manipulating the money supply or the other things they do to manipulate it with is is distort the market. The market's there. The market's going to do what it does. Well, I, I think people want to wish away um, supply and demand. They want to wish away the rules of, of economics. I wrote a book years ago called A Conservative History of the American Left. And the conclusion I came to is that, um, you know, things like uh, the, the brotherhood of man, um, the perfectibility of man, uh, equality, all of these things were beautiful dreams. And on the road to those beautiful dreams, people would do really, really awful things to, to get there. The ends yeah. always justified the means. And they would never really learn from these mistakes because the animating principle for them was not reality, but it was the dream in their head. And I wonder to what extent uh, economics follows that pattern where they're willing to sort of wish away all of these um, laws of economics because they have this dream that, well, gee, you know, wouldn't it be good to have all these programs? So who cares if we have to um, trash our currency to get it? Because the really the, the thing that's important is the Green New Deal or Build Back Better Act or right. whatever particular dream they have at that moment. Um, it's tough to get in their head, but that's about the, the, the that's about the, as far as I will venture. In, in I have personally, things. yeah, well, I'm, I'm with you on that. I think a lot of it, instead of uh, doing like, okay, we don't like the way America does this. Okay, compared to what, right? Well, they're comparing it to some ut utopian nonsense that they've been fed in high school or college or both. That gets down to elementary school now. But um, but I, I have personally talked to people who are, who are they call themselves progressives. Um, that's not what I call them. I, call, I mean, in, in many ways, they're nihilists. But the, the, um, they think the law of supply and demand they think this is an artifact of capitalism or just jargon. I mean, they don't understand. I, I mean, these are smart people I'm talking about, and, and they're not kids. You know, they're, they're people that are my age who actually believe the law of supply and demand is just an artifact of capitalism instead of a law of nature. And I, when, I, when I make the, the law of nature argument, and you can, if, if you got a hummingbird feeder, you want to observe. The, the law of supply and demand in nature, you, want, you, you put your hummingbird feeder out there, just put one of them out there and see what the hummingbirds do the closer it gets down to migration time. It's supply and demand. And whoever is the biggest, meanest um, uh, hummingbird is going to control the entire food supply. I didn't realize uh, hummingbirds were mean. Oh, they're mean as hell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, I didn't but, know that you learned something new all the time. Yeah, the, the uh, birds called us the Hummer Wars. September. Right. Yeah, it's it's and, and so and, but you can see it in any in any in natural um, uh, setting where you've got um, say a, 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 a dead uh, uh, porcupine on the road, right? It, 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 one vulture lands, you know. Okay, so those are some birds I understand are mean. I can get okay, behind they, that. But yeah. the hummingbird, that's a little difficult for me to wrap my brain around. I, I have that, watched so. it. I, I, we're, we're getting off the beaten path, but I'm telling you, it, <laughs> it's, it, they're, they're, they're meaner than most animals you know about when, when it comes to, to controlling the food supply. But anyway, the point is you can observe it in nature. The, the law of supply and demand is a law of nature. And when, when, I, when I tell my, my progressive friends, when I can get them to stop long enough, to listen to me and I explain this to them they look at me like you know Dave's Dave's been skipping his meds again you know they, they, it never occurred to them that this could possibly be true I, I, I often have thought that it would be before you allow people to vote you should make them at least take econ 101 and have somebody explain to them some of just just the basic thing I mean, they, they don't need to know about macro economics. They might, they they might get <laughs> twisted if they take Econ 101. Do we have questions from the audience? Yes. I actually have one right here, and I think it's more di directed at you. Um, the viewer writes, do you think the current inflation crisis will, pu will push public support for reinstating the Bretton Woods system or adopting similar monetary reforms? I do not. Um, I think we're so far from that. I know it's a dream of a lot of people to, um, you know, f for instance, like something like 
going to the gold standard. And I'm not saying I'm for the gold standard or against the gold standard. I think it'd probably be better than what we have now. Um, I, I don't, you know, that's a dream of a lot of people. Von Mises and Austrian economics people, that's a dream of theirs. Someone like Milton Friedman would say some, maybe we could have it based on a mathematical equation or something like that. But I think the bottom line is that, you know, we went through this 40 years ago and a lot of people forgot have forgotten that if you pursue these policies, bad things happen. If you, if you, um, you know, create money out of thin air, you're going to devalue your currency and you're going to get inflation. It may be something that we have to go through every, you know, periodically every 40 years for people to get religion on it. I think what, what's going to have to happen in the future is, um, you know, people are going to not be, uh, I mean, some people will always be pushing for low interest rates and some people will be always be pushing for loose money. Um, but I think people will probably get religion and realize, well, you can't do that without some consequences. And I think post Paul Volcker, that kind of lasted for like 40 years or so, um, more or less, you know, with some variation, but more or less that sort of lasted for 40 years. And I think we've kind of forgotten some of those lessons. I don't know that we're going to go back to Bretton Woods. I don't know that we're going to go back to a gold standard or anything like that. We're not. But hopefully we go away from what has been governing the Federal Reserve I think probably since like the crisis of 2008, more or less. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously it went on steroids the last couple of years. Yeah. Uh, in a related uh, <clears throat> area, one reason I think many people are happy to trash our currency is that uh, the dollar is the world's reserve currency. And we do know that our friends like China and now with Russia would ha be happily re replace it. Uh, even the euro, I think, for a while, uh, had such thoughts. Yeah. But how, how much abuse can we kind of uh, give our, our currency before the uh, prestige role the dollar plays in the world? Well, that's, appears. that's one of the, the, the interesting political questions is um, whoever runs the Biden ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we know that that a lot of good advice from a lot of left of center economists have been ignored in order to get where we are at this moment, you know? And so, and so the question that, that occurs to me, and this is, this is, we're getting into sort of tinfoil hat stuff is, are they deliberately, you know, I mean, we, we know that they're deliberately not doing anything about it, but I mean, are they deliberately doing it to, to, uh, for the reasons you're discussing, uh, because maybe, um, they don't really like the idea of having the dollar being what I, it is. I, I doubt that. I, I don't know that there's anyone that doesn't want the dollar as a reserve currency who's who's an American or at least who, you know, I, I, I think most people would realize how catastrophic that is. I would also say we're probably a, a bit away from that, although there has been movement from China and Russia to in the sort of international trading with oil and different things, they've, they've tried to contractually make their currency um, take the place of the dollar in certain deals with, with foreign countries. And that's been met with some, you know, mixed results. They clearly want that. I think we're a ways away from that, but it's also the case that people should realize that, you know, um, the, the dollar has not always been king. Cash has always been king, but the dollar hasn't always been king. You know, uh, things change. Schlitz used to be the number one beer. It's not anymore. And I bet people in the, in the 50s thought Schlitz is going to be the number one beer forever. Why do things get toppled? Um, they do. And, and um, you know, we're doing something that could hasten that day. I just think we're a little bit far away from it. And if we're talking about tinfoil hat stuff, hey, listen, this week on Capitol Hill, they're talking about UFOs and spacemen and people from other planets. So, I, you know, if they can do it, we can too. Right. What yeah. pronouns do they use? Okay. To refer to themselves. That, um, <laughs> that, that thing, uh, you know, Yesterday, I saw that, that they were doing that hearing. And I'm thinking, okay, we've got inflation that's out of control. We got the thing in, in Ukraine. We've got the border that's out of control. We got people who can't buy baby food. And the Democrats are actually having a hearing on UFOs. Take I mean, me to your leader. I mean, I, 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 I'm telling you, I, this, when I saw that, I'm like, these people, uh, we got to get rid of these people. I mean, <laughs> because, I mean, that that is... That is a, a sign of, of a group of people who are really not serious about government. 
They, Listen, when, the, when the Martian invasion comes, you will change your tune quickly, and you will realize <laughs> that those those guys had a bead on everything. So, well, maybe they'll understand economics. Okay, <laughs> economics not going to matter when the Martians come. It's, anyhow, <laughs> I mean that, that's just it's incredible. Uh, so, um, but you know, getting back to um, the, the how the dollar is viewed throughout the planet. Um, you know, I, I'm not sure we don't have. And this is again, this is the tinfoil hat bit. I'm sure I'm not sure we don't have a fifth column um, uh, in our government who uh, would prefer that it not be the, the major reserve currency. I, I really don't. I, I, and it'd be interesting to hear if we had a, a reader poll because I, because I, I see this all the time on comments on my article. For example, the, the other article that, that I wrote for Monday. I mean, the, the, half the commenters said they are doing this deliberately. Well, I think that's the, that's the impulse that a lot of people have. And um, I, I don't think, because there's a lot of people saying something on a comments board, I don't put any stock into that. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of people that want to, um, you know, put bad motives on people and say, well, this is really a conspiracy to undermine us, whatever. Maybe they're just dumb. Maybe well, they're just weasels. And I, I think that uh, maybe they just want to spend a whole bunch of money. Um, the effect of it is 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 bad enough for me. Um, when you start getting into intense, like you said, that is the, sort of the tinfoil hat area. I don't, um, I can't divine their intent. Yeah, I know. It, it's it's a, I mean, it's hard to believe that you know that that I have got a granddaughter who's getting ready to next year going to go go to the University of Georgia. She gets this. So it's really difficult for, for me to believe that the people who run our government don't understand the damage that they're doing. Okay, And so the, the question is, are they do they just not care because they're in power? And as long as they're in power, they don't really care about the rest of it. Listen, these are people that think men can breastfeed. So if they can think that, they can, they can, they can think a lot of weird stuff. Do we have a, another question from the audience or is it... Um, I saw that. that's been forwarded to me right now. Oh, nice. Mm -hmm. Well, but, um, no, I mean, I can just return up something that's sort of been obsessing me. I mean, how long is this going to last? And when does when do things start getting better? Three years. Mm -hmm. How many? Three. Three. Okay. I, I can't it's, think that far into the future, but if you if you look at what they said they're going to do, it doesn't match with what they're doing. They are raising the interest rates, good, but as far as um, you know, whittling down that that um, eight point nine trillion in assets that the Federal Reserve holds, um, it's still at that high number. It, it, it hasn't changed. It's changed like a you know tiny tiny fraction of a percent, mm -hmm. but it's still eight point nine trillion. So. Um, they say they're going to do it. They know what they have to do, but they haven't done it yet. And people will say, well, there's sort of bureaucratic inertia and there's reasons why it, it hasn't gone down. Mm -hmm. But this has been a long time coming and that train is going to, those wheels are going to start to move and it, and it hasn't. And until they do, we're going to be dealing with, with these issues. Well, the, the, the people who make the decisions now, meaning the, the people who control the White House and Congress and, and by virtue of that, um, the the, uh, the Fed, etc. Um, until the voters take a two by four to them, the way you would take a two by four to a mule, until the voters uh, mm -hmm. deliver a very unmistakable, unambiguous message that we are not going to put up with this, that's what's going to stop it. Now that means in in 2022, obviously, all you can do is take Congress away from it, and Joe's still there. And, and uh, uh, you know, being uh, in charge of the executive branch, you still got lots of power to work, lots of mischief with the money supply. Well, I, th I think the problem that he faces is that it's an election year. And usually on election year, you want loose money because it's the thinking is that it's going to pump up the economy. You're going to want to prime the pump. And so the, he's saying the biggest domestic issue is inflation. You can't, you can't have that as your biggest domestic issue and then prime the pump. And so I think one of the, the reasons why we're being held back um, as far as making progress on inflation is because we are in an election year 
and the people controlling things realize that any kind of, of solution to this is necessarily going to be painful. And they're afraid of that kind of hurt even more than they're afraid of the hurt at the grocery store, at the supermarket checkout line, at the, at the gas station and so on. Hey Dan, we do have another question nice. from a viewer, uh, specifically, quote, do you think the government wants inflation to decrease our pension obligations? I, I don't I don't think so. I, I don't think that's the reason this is happening. I think what they want is um, they want to pay for stuff that they can't afford. And they're they're basically like, you know, when you see some of these people, um, you know, the most people who I know are rich. Um, don't go around spending their money everywhere and buying expensive sneakers and gold chains. But people who aren't rich think that's what it means to be rich, that they spend all their money and they're, they're extravagant, exorbitant. You know, most people I know are rich. A lot of them have like cars that are like 10 years old, that kind of thing. And so um, I, I would liken that situation to what's going on with, with um, regard to inflation, that they don't know. Um, they think the reason, uh, you know, that the countries are wealthy is because you, you spend all this money and you go into debt and you do all this, this profligate kind of thing. Um, when in fact, you know, that's not, that's not the way to do it. Mm -hmm. And, um, that's what they, that's what, I think that's what they want. They want to spend money that they don't have, like, you know, some, uh, 22 year old Instagram influencer, um, and they, they, it's not because they want to wipe out your pension fund or something like that. That's just sort of an effect of it. I think, I think, I mean, there is a, an element of that. Um, I mean, let's, let's face it. Inflation is good for people who have debt because the, the value, the amount of, that they actually owe shrinks because sure. the value, if you owe it in a dollar amount, if you've got say $10,000 on your credit card, right? Next year is going to be $9,000. You know, and, and so and so, if, if you think of the, the federal deficit, oh, okay, as yeah. as 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 debt, um, you know, inflation worked great for for bringing down the cost of paying that debt. But um, it, it, the so you know whether they think this sophisticatedly or not, I, I have no idea. I, I didn't understand the question initially, and I, I understand it now that David has explained it, and I, I get it. When we when people owe so much debt. It makes sense to inflate the currency because all of a sudden you don't owe it. There may be a little bit of that element to it. And I, I'm sorry for dismissing that that um, out of hand. I, I get it. And yeah, that that's that's probably part of it. Yeah, I, uh, you know, again, it's it's always, I guess we're getting close to being out of time. Here. Yeah, yeah. But it, it, there's always an element of, um, or the, there's no, it's always the question is how much they know. You know, are they dishonest or are they dumb? Are they both? The people that control us. Probably both, in my sense. Okay. Uh, would you like to sum up anything, Dave, Dan? Uh, well, I would, uh, my summary would be pretty short, which is mm -hmm. the, uh, I think inflation, as I've said a couple of times now in writing, inflation, that you can't hide inflation. No matter who controls the media, no matter who controls the spin coming out of the White House or Congress, they can't hide it. I'm, I'm pretty sure, uh, unless unless there's serious skullduggery in the election in the midterms, I think the voters are going to send them a message saying, "Do something about this now." And so uh, that's that's the political effect of this. And, and there's no way they can prevent that. That's the reason they're looking at UFOs or, he, or Joe's going up there and he's bringing up Charlottesville again and the, you know the, the, the pursuit of this latest shooting. So uh, yeah. I think that the, 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 there's no hiding it, and the, there's no, no hiding what the, what the voters are going to do to these people in, in November. Okay. Yeah, I, I just think that inflation is um, inherently about honesty. It's about honest currency, and when you have an issue that, at its core, is about um, rigging something uh, like a, a shell game or something to to, to make it uh, less valuable than it than it really is uh, for for the benefit of someone. Um, people are going to explain it in dishonest ways. And I think that's what we see from uh, the government. That's what we see from the Biden administration and others. The alpha and omega of this is money. And once you start having a prudent fiscal policy, and this goes for Democrats and Republicans, um, we'll start to see a more prudent monetary policy. And until that day, 
you're going to have this reckless monetary policy and you're going to have a monetary policy that um, has a deflationary effect on the value of the dollar in your pocket. Um, and so that's why it's so important that we, you know, it doesn't mean that you get it, you know, have no deficits or something like that. I have a deficit on this house I'm living. I got to pay the bank for it. Um, so I'm not saying, I'm not being anti-deficit. I'm just saying that um, the type of, you know, when you go from a deficit that's under a trillion dollars in 2019 to two years in a row where it's basically somewhere around three trillion, um, you've done something um, so out of the ordinary and so unexpected that it's going to have ramifications. And the ramification is that we have a money supply in terms of M1 that is uh, five times the amount as it was in, in 2019 and COVID played a role in that, Federal Reserve played a role in that. And you have a Federal Reserve balance sheet that's more than double what it was in 2019. And when you do those things, when you have an oversupply of money, um, the money's not gonna be as valuable as it once was. Okay. Well, thank you, Dan, and thank you, Dave. And thank you to our viewers for joining us today. It's been fun. Oh, yeah. For a real fun subject. <laughs> right. Yeah, and we didn't even talk about the stock market. Thank God. Yeah. Well, <laughs> will that ever come back? Okay. So we'll see you next time. And thank you again. Good afternoon.